welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me on Flying Solo today, but my guest is awesome, so this is going to be a fantastic duo. You've had him on before, we've had him on twice, he's corrected me on instead of saying Hercules to Heracles, yes, he came on and did our Disney show. We also talked about the magic of uh, of Delphi, but he's here to talk about his new book, which is The Michael Scott. Yes, I should have mentioned who we've got, first of all. Uh, his new book is called X Marks the Spot, The Story of Archaeology and Eight Extraordinary Discoveries. Michael, thank you for coming on to History Hack. Uh, it's a pleasure, and I look forward to being corrected multiple times during the course of this interview by yourself. Me, me correcting? No, no, that's only Linda. Linda's the only one that's allowed to correct you, not me. <laughs> well, hey, you know, we can break all the rules today. Why not? Do you know what? I think for fun, I might start saying things wrong just to get you to correct oh. me because that would just be far more entertaining. I think well, people I, would I, like that. I'll tell, I'll tell you one thing. So so this book it kind of, you know, is breaking out of my usual kind of stomping ground of the Greek and Roman worlds, right? And we're looking at discoveries from across the entire globe. And uh, when I was writing it, as a result, it was a fascinating kind of journey of discovery, you know, getting involved in Peruvian archaeology and then in Russian archaeology and then archaeology in Africa and in China as well as in the Mediterranean. And then uh, kind of writing it up, all really, really happy. And then they said, oh, would you like to record the audio book? which I went to do in a studio. And of course, the moment you have to record the audiobook, you realise you have to know how to pronounce all oh of God. the names. Uh, and suddenly I realised that I was being challenged with pronunciation from everything from kind of, uh, uh, in, in, you know, how do you pronounce ancient Inca ruler names, um, <laughs> all the way through to locations in sort of the crossover point of, of Mongolia, China and Russia uh, and, you know, and everywhere in between. Um, and I suddenly realised that, that that kind of actually pronunciation is a, t- is a tough job indeed. Um, and, uh, you know, any prizes, prizes to your listeners who, who download the audiobook version of X Marks the Spot and pick up where I've made no doubt multiple errors and can come back and let you know uh, where I have mispronounced names and you can have an eternal list with which to uh, hit me over the head when I come on the show in the future. You know what? I think that'd be quite interesting. We've got to definitely do that. I think that's uh, going to be quite entertaining as it is. Okay, do you know what? Let's kick off with the first question. I mean, this question, I don't like it, but we're going to say it anyway, which is why is archaeology so important? I mean, it's really important for you and for your field anyway, but yeah, it's kind of important for my field too. So I can't really dismiss it that much. Well, kind of, this book didn't start off as uh, as being a history of archaeology. Right, that sounds quite dry, doesn't it? Sounds quite, quite dull, to be honest. Um, it, it started off because I think everyone is just a little bit fascinated by stories of discovery. Right, that eureka moment when something is found, and uh, actually, it was kind of trying to sort of just just dig in a little bit to what is it about that fascination with that moment of discovery. And I suddenly realised that it wasn't something that, you know, we're just fascinated about today. Actually, you can go back all the way into the ancient past past to the Greeks and Romans, and they were equally fascinated by discovery of their ancient pasts. Um, And there's what became clearer and clearer to me is that there is a, there is a sort of eternal love affair, right, between uh, kind of our, our understanding of our present but equally trying to make sense of our present in relation to the people who have walked in our footsteps in these spaces before us. And as a, as a result, kind of what, what became clear to me is that kind of searching for the past and particularly the physical remnants of the past, which is, you know, archaeology, the sort of discovery of the material remains, is a kind of quintessential human itch. It's kind of part of actually what makes us uh, human beings and, and kind of the way that we approach the world. And I think that's because inevitably you know our world that we live is is in some ways curated and set up for us by those who have been 
kind of here before us. And as a result, kind of you can't understand why things work in the way they do today and why things are built in the way they are and why cities have evolved in the way that they have or whatever it might be without understanding what the kind of physical landscape and, and kind of cultures and civilizations that, that inhabited that physical landscape were like um, before us. So that's kind of where the, the, the sort of initial kind of interest in that, that, that moment of discovery and our fascination with that moment of discovery expanded into, whoa, this is actually something quite uh, fundamental about our humanity is that kind of desire to be connected to particularly the physical remnants of the past. But then how do you tell that story? And kind of what evolved for me is kind of picking up on kind of key for me, really important um, discoveries that have happened over the last 200 years or so that as a result ended up actually telling the story of the development of archaeology as a modern discipline. You know, our earliest discovery that we treat in the book is the discovery of the Rosetta Stone in Egypt in 1799. And it's really then that archaeology as a discipline is evolving out of what had previously been the case of antiquarianism, where people were just moving around, grabbing things because they look shiny, because they look pretty, because they look nice, and taking them and going, ooh, doesn't this look nice? You know, kind of... Um, and evolving into an actual sense of, OK, what is this thing? What does it tell us about the cultures it came from? What can we understand about the context that it was found in? And actually trying to put that object or place or whatever it might be back into a story of an understanding of an ancient civilization or moment in time. Um, and as a result, fill in the blanks of our past and what the the eight stories the eight objects and locations that we look at through the book do as they move forward in time from 1799 through to right now 2023 um, is tell us how archaeology has evolved and that means the people who do it uh, it means the techniques and styles uh, and things that uh, they do do still they don't do anymore and things which have evolved and become possible because technology has evolved etc um, but also kind of you know I became fascinated as a result not just in the discovery moments but in the discoverers as people because these are fascinating and pretty much always quite weird and wacky and wonderful individuals um, but also then I became fascinated in what do we do with the find and the story we tell about it once it's been discovered because I think discovery we have in our sense because it happens and then it's done you know, discovery's finished and it could be a moment, it could be a bit longer than a moment, but actually in a number of these stories, discovery ends up taking decades and never ends. So the kind of how do we tell and then keep retelling the eternally evolving discovery story of what this object actually is, what it means, both in an academic sense and increasingly in the public consciousness. So all of that, we're trying to wrap up together in a story uh, of the story of archaeology through eight extraordinary discoveries. I've got to say, I think while you were talking about this, the one thing I know I'm going to bring this up again, and I bring this up in a lot of podcasts, not recently, like funny enough, is Pompeii and how Pompeii, the excavation of Pompeii has evolved because we're still excavating. Yeah. We're still using new technologies to discover things. And remind me when Pompeii was discovered was 17 something. God, my yeah. Brain yeah, yeah, yeah. Right at the beginning of the story of archaeology, again, kind of, you know, yeah. And, and, and it's still there and it will go on, you know, being mm. part of our discovery list for I expect at least a good another century if not longer and you know you're right you know new technologies have evolved at the same time as actually old technologies have, have been brought into play so one of the things that I love about Pompeii is that the new superintendenza in control of Pompeii has introduced sheep sheep are the new cutting edge tool in Pompeii and sheep are now being brought in to wander the ruins and they chomp away at the grass and keep all the grass away uh, keep all the grass down the ruins without damaging any of the remains, which would be damaged if you went in there with mechanical mowers and you know trimmers and strimmers and all of that kind of thing. They realised that no one can do it better than a flock of sheep. So sheep I love are, are the cutting edge element of Pompeii. That's so clear. I haven't, I haven't been to Pompeii, gosh, in about six years now. So I've, now I've got to go because I want to go. Can you pet the sheep? Uh, if you can find them, if you can get to them, yeah. I'm in. I'm into going to Pompeii to pet sheep and obviously the ruins because it's one of the, probably my favourite sites of archaeological discoveries. Anyway, you mentioned this already, which is the Rosetta Stone that was discovered by Napoleon's army. Our lovely friend Sam will probably agree that this is one of archaeology, archaeology's greatest finds. Tell us more about the Rosetta Stone. 
Yeah, so the book starts with the, the story of the Rosetta Stone, and you know it, it stands today in the British Museum. But obviously, its journey there has uh, has been is you know itself an, an absolutely fascinating story. And and you mentioned it comes uh, as a result of the discovery by Napoleon's army, and that puts us in the context back in 1799 of the fact that that early archaeology really is being pushed and directed and curated by these great massive geopolitical forces, which are nation states often either going to war or trying to take over control of and add a particular area to their empire. And in uh, 1799, France was determined to counteract the British uh, uh, possession and influence in India by taking Egypt, right? That was their kind of riposte to the British by if they controlled Egypt, then they would they would have they would recorrect that 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 geopolitical balance of the world stage. But at the same time, what was happening in France in particular, as well as a number of other European countries, was everyone was becoming fascinated with the idea of ancient Egypt. Now, ancient Egypt up to this point hadn't really been studied much at all. If there had, it had been studied in biblical narrative terms. But now there was a whole kind of revolutionary movement which thought about ancient Egypt as actually being the source of a whole uh, kind of amount of cultural knowledge, um, particularly kind of mysticism, esoteric knowledge. Actually, if you wanted to be really quite new and cutting edge and daring in 18th century France, you tried to imitate the ancient Egyptians. And of course, France had just been through a revolution, right? So it had been, it had done the ultimate cutting edge revolutionary thing uh, and had a revolution. So France wanted to own Egypt, both in terms of modern geopolitics, but it also wanted to position itself as the inheritors of the culture of ancient Egypt. So as to kind of in, be the inheritors of all of that, both mysticism, cultural uh, influence and kind of uh, be the new revolutionary cutting edge people um, on the uh, kind of on the block, as it were. So Napoleon uh, was sent at the head of a, a, an army to um, not only capture Egypt, but also to study it. And so in amongst his army on the ships, uh, which was the largest flotilla to set sail for Egypt since the time of the Roman Empire, he had a whole bunch of academics uh, and they were called les savants. Uh, the knowledgeable ones. And they were uh, knowledgeable in all sorts of areas, everything from geography to kind of hydraulics through to culture, to heritage, to history, to kind of archaeology as it, as it you know, was emerging at that point in time. And they all went there. And the moment he gets off his ships, I mean, the conquest of Egypt hasn't even finished before he set up his research institute of Egypt um, in Cairo and um, kind of the savant, uh, les savants are getting to work. And then in 1799, on the 15th of July, in fact, um, there, a, a group of soldiers were working in the town of uh, Rashid, uh, kind of known to Westerners as Rosetta, and they were trying to build up a dilapidated fort. And they literally uncovered in the sand this big piece of stone, which one of the soldiers, who was kind of partly kind of trained by the the, the academics, Les Savants, noticed that it had writing on it. And then he so he showed it to his superior, who was able to read ancient Greek. Uh, one of the languages on this text was ancient Greek, and it said in ancient Greek, this text is being written here in these three languages. And so this guy, this soldier, recognized that this stone actually had the same text written in three languages, one of which was ancient Greek, the other was Egyptian hieroglyphs, and the other was at that stage an unknown language which we now know as, as demotic. And so he realised right then, that day, kind of the possibility that this stone with the ancient Greek and Egyptian hieroglyphs saying the same thing could possibly be a key to helping the academics understand Egyptian hieroglyphs. Because we'd completely forgotten how to read Egyptian hieroglyphs up to that point. Of course, people used to, in the long distant past, be able to read and write hieroglyphs. Uh, and right through to the end of the Roman Empire in the 4th century CE, they had been reading and writing Egyptian hieroglyphs. But the moment the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, Egyptian hieroglyphs have become the religious language of pagan, the pagan world, and as a result had been banned and outlawed, and the world had collectively turned away from using them and being able to understand them. And as a result, humanity had collectively forgotten how to read Egyptian hieroglyphs from the 4th century CE right the way through to the 18th century. Here was now a chance to actually redecipher the language of Egyptian hieroglyphs through this stone that had two identical texts on it. So the stone was sent immediately to the Institute in Cairo, to Les Savants, who got to work on it. But that was in 1799, and it would take through until 1822 to actually break that hieroglyphic code and uh, decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs once again. And it would take a, an international armada of academics um, to be able to do it. In the meantime, 
Napoleon continued with his conquest of Egypt, uh, but then kind of had to head back to France, where obviously he would go on to become kind of, you know, ruler and emperor. Uh, the British sailed in and basically uh, forced the remaining French troops in Egypt to surrender, hand over the Rosetta Stone because they'd heard about it by this stage. It had become so quickly a famous object. They nabbed it and they sailed it back to Britain, presented it to the king and the king presented it to the British Museum, which is where it still resides today. So the British stole a discovery in layman's terms. Well, it was part of the surrender negotiations, right? Uh, so, you know, this is this is the hard the hard job of of how do you apply our modern categorizations and understandings of things to things that happened in very different worlds. Right? And at the time, here we were, you know, uh, a, a ruling power was uh, organizing the surrender of uh, kind of the French and the surrender terms included a whole bunch of the material culture that they had so far discovered because everyone now in Europe, uh, including Britain, was waking up to the desire to be associated with the wonders of ancient Egypt. And the Rosetta Stone, kind of in its story, really kicks off the next hundred years of what on the one hand is called Egyptomania, where lots of European nations are kind of going to Egypt and grabbing whatever they can find and hauling it back to their different museums around around Europe. Um, but equally, the kind of nicer side of that kicks off the actual archaeological investigation and discovery of ancient Egypt, which will culminate in uh, 1922 with the discovery of, of Tutankhamun's tomb uh, by Edward Carter. I mean, the next question, um, well, grave robbing happened everywhere. You say, like I said, again, bring up Pompeii, because I do. Uh, you see it in Pompeii, for example, even years after the, after the volcano erupted. You see it now in Syria. You see, you see it everywhere. You see results. You see evidence. You see everything. So talking about Mark Stein and his work in China, how does that fit into this idea of grave robbing? Yeah, you know, again, so so the second story we look at in the book is a, is a, an explorer called Mark Orwell Stein, who was originally um, Hungarian, but actually ended up taking British citizenship. And he worked for most of his career in India, in positions in the sort of British rule of India. But he was particularly interested in the turn of the, the 20th century. So 1900, 1901 was his first expedition. He got funding from British government uh, and others to, to go by foot and by kind of a mule and horseback up from India, across the great Pamir mountains um, that sort of sit across the, the, the top um, of northern India and, and Pakistan, to get into what is today known as the Taklamakan Desert, which is part of, of modern day China. But at that stage was a massive blank on the map. And we have to remember at the turn of the 20th century, this was a, ma a really important era of investigation of the big remaining blanks on the map. And what were those blanks? So in 1900, 1905, teams are going to Antarctica. That's a blank on the map. And they're going to the Taklamaka Desert. That's the other big blank on the map. People just didn't know right, what was there. And yet at the same time, this was an incredibly important, again, geopolitical area in world politics because British, the British were in India. They were particularly concerned about to, to what extent Russia could actually push south and end up actually kind of in direct conflict with the British in India. And that re revolved around to what extent would it be possible to get an army actually through these mountain ranges and these great blanks on the map down from Russia towards India. So up for the you know, 40, 50 years before Stein was exploring up in the Taklamakan Desert, there'd been something called a great game afoot between British and Russia as they were literally trying to map the mountain passes to see whether an army could fit through or not, and where the borders of actually nations in the area really were. So Stein goes up into this unknown area on the map, into the Taklamakan Desert, which is one of the most inhospitable areas in the world. You know, it's, it's a shifting sand, sand desert the size of Germany, um, kind of, and it's it, the only place life can survive around it are um, right around the northern and southern edges of the Taklamakan Desert, where um, o small oases form as the mountains that, that surround the desert on both north and south sides um, create sort of small kind of, you know, areas where water accumulates. And you have these tiny oasis communities that live around the north and south. Um, 
And Stein was getting uh, kind of marched up there and then explored through the desert. He was excavating as he went in the desert and he was finding extraordinary sorts of things which don't survive in any other part of the world because of the dry sand conditions. So it was manuscripts, you know, paper manuscripts that would have disappeared uh, long, long ago anywhere else. And what they were proving, which at the time was a revolutionary idea, was that cultures, communities, languages, knowledge had moved east and west in the ancient world, in what we now know today as the Silk Roads, right? But the idea of the Silk Roads was only just coming into being at this time. And he was showing that uh, Greek images of gods were appearing on documents in the Taklamakan Desert in modern day, you know, in China that had transferred there in antiquity. Languages that had yet undiscovered at that point were moving kind of across the entire area that, that he was excavating um, across the, the, the length and breadth of the Taklamakan. So his finds and discoveries were incredibly important in terms of demonstrating that there had been an absolute arterial blood flow of ideas, languages, cultures and civilizations from east to west and west to east in antiquity. Yeah, what he's most famous for, kind of as you point out, is that he made his way all the way to Dunhuang, uh, where there is the the uh, kind of thousand uh, Buddha, thousand the thousand caves of Buddha, the kind of grotto caves there, um, the kind of very famous actual active religious site. And there he discovered that the one of the local monks who was the sort of guardian uh, called Wang Yanlu had discovered a, uh, a a hidden cave full of manuscripts. And he's very open about the fact, Mark Rolstein, in the publications he wrote at the time, which just shows you kind of how acceptable at the time this sort of behaviour was, that he effectively persuaded, cajoled and paid Wang Yanlu to give him a whole bunch of these manuscripts, which he then carted off in crates and crates and crates back across the Taklamakan Desert and eventually to India and to Britain. Um, and these manuscripts were all Buddhist um, sutras and other kind of uh, both both kind of images as well as texts. And they've been, an, you know, an incredible, incredible resource to study ever since. And in fact, the study of them continues today. There's been so many of them. Um, and he wasn't the only one to do it. A couple of months after he was there, a French uh, explorer called Paul Pellio turned up at Dunhuang as well and bought even more manuscripts um, of uh, the same guy, which ended up back uh, in the Louvre and other kind of uh, museums and libraries in France. Um, but quite clearly, this was of a different kind of uh, kind of exploration, discovery and uh, kind of archaeological recuperation, because this was a live religious site where effectively he paid what in reality was a pittance um, for objects that he had sort of persuaded this man to give up, whose right it was to give them up in the first place is pretty kind of uh, you know unclear as well. And the Chinese government have been very, very clear really since the 1930s onwards um, that they see this as one of the great kind of betrayals and, and sort of um, stealings of early uh, kind of Chinese culture um, by the West, uh, kind of by the foreign devils, as, as they put it. So you know, kind of nowadays, would we ever do this again? No, I absolutely hope not. And no one would look at this as an example of how archaeology should be done today. But it is important to remember that when it was being done in the 1900s, it was an entirely uh, you know, acceptable form of behaviour, um, but one that, you know, quite clearly, we do not wish to repeat anymore. I completely agree with this whole idea that we should not put our own values on the past. And even my field, so you're looking at the 1930s and 1940s, that's what, 70, 80 years ago, we still can't put our modern values against what people were deciding, what people were doing, their decisions at that time. And talking about even further back, let's say ancient time period, you can't judge someone or a, a nation for doing something that for them was morally right. Or, for example, for this guy who thought in himself that he could go, literally pay off, get grab a bunch of manuscripts and take for him, that was morally right at the end of the day. Uh, it was morally justifiable, you know, and kind of the for, for the point of view when you read his his public accounts, you know, and it's not dry academic tomes. What I find fascinating about Mark Stein's story is that you know, as he was engaged in his expeditions, his expeditions were being serialized in the Times, live reports coming through. He then wrote popular you know, history books, the kind of public facing books about his explorations that were bestsellers. You know, in the era, these people who went out to fill in the blanks on the map and discover these stuff were 
absolute famous characters um, in their own right. And he's very open uh, you know, in that context about what he did and how he did it um, and, and justifies it from the perspective of he was helping to ensure the preservation of these manuscripts for the future. Now, that's an impossible argument to ever uh, argue against, isn't it? Because you can't know what would have happened to these manuscripts if they'd stayed in the place that they were, had hitherto been kept. Um, but uh, kind of, you know, as, as I said, uh, I think we have to be very, very careful about um, just automatically categorizing in modern terminology uh, I I actions and activities of previous generations, cultures um, and kind of and mindsets. Um, but we can talk about what we would continue to do or not do today. And we can also should, you know, continue to discuss whether or not on a case by case basis, we think that actually these now we see as wrongs of the past should be righted in our terms by trying to return these objects or at least make them more available. So in the case of the manuscripts, um, you know, now one of the things which I think is extremely positive is that there is a digitization program of all of these manuscripts, not just in Britain, but uh, that were taken to the different museums around Europe um, to make all of these manuscripts digitally accessible in, in high digital resolution so that people from all over the world can actually study and access them, uh, which I think is an important and good step forward. This is such a hot topic. I mean, even we were discussing this at, at university level for me. Should we return these objects to the countries that they've come from? And I think that's actually, do you know what? I think we should do a podcast on that. I will get a couple of uh, academics on and we can do a whole discussion because I think that's worth worth exploring, really, because everybody's got their own opinion and their own ideas for this. I mean, you and I could differ. We could be similar, but I think it would be worth doing a podcast. I know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of the, ne the next story we look at in the book, um, which is the story of the discovery of Machu Picchu, uh, kind of around the same time, sort of 1911 is when the discovery kicks off by a guy called Hiram Bingham III. Now, he too kind of took crates and crates and crates of stuff from Machu Picchu um, over the sort of three seasons that he was excavating there. And actually what's happened there is that in 2011, when it was the 100 year kind of anniversary of, of the discovery, um, actually uh, the Yale uh, Peabody Museum, which is where most of this stuff went, actually gave back most of that stuff to the modern Peruvian government so that it could be set up in a museum in Cusco, the sort of main town nearest to the discovery of Machu Picchu. So um, there's a number of uh, stories that we look at in the book where kind of actually returns have been agreed upon and have been done. Uh, equally, some where kind of actually, you know, there's still kind of outstanding uh, dilemmas and discussions. And equally, we look at a couple of examples um you know and one is is kind of out in 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 russia in 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 the kind of steppe area of 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 the modern day altai region where uh, even though the body of a um you know a, a nomadic uh, sort of a female of the 4th century bce uh she, her body has now been returned to the local area there is actually ongoing discussion and debate and dissent about how now she should be treated back in the local area in which um, she came from. You know, should she be reburied entirely? Should she be displayed in the museum? If she's going to be displayed in the museum, how do you show the proper respect uh, to her? It kind of, you know, and how do you find the compromise point? So it's not just about return. It's not the only issue. I guess it would uh, I would point out. It's actually about kind of then well, uh, what happens next with these objects uh, and ideas and civilizations? How do you actually engage them in the present um, and kind of ensure that they are still um, available to the present for scientific analysis, but also for engagement uh, kind of the wider public and for their story to continue to be told? OK, so the next one we have is sponge diving. First of all, I have absolutely no idea what that is, and I'm assuming our listeners have absolutely no idea what that is. Explain to us what does what what is sponge diving and how does it lead to archaeological discovery? Okay, well, so we're dialing forward to the 1980s, but actually, sponge diving itself has a lot longer history. This going back to antiquity. This is where people are diving down under the sea to cut free the natural sponges that grow on the sea floor. Uh, and sort of up through until the beginning of the 20th century, there was a, you know, a, a, a healthy um, economic uh, sort of market for sponges because natural sponges produced on the seafloor, cut free, brought up, dried, make a very, very, very nice product to, to use on the human skin. Uh, that demand exploded uh, kind of uh, in the middle of the 20th century with the result that kind of actually populations of natural sea sponges on the seafloor 
deteriorated massively at an unsustainable rate. Um, and obviously now it is, a, uh, it is an industry that is, as a result, dying off, partly because sea sponges just aren't uh, there in such numbers anymore, sadly, and also because people have realised the damage that collecting them is doing um, and are moving towards other kind of more synthetic kind of forms of, kind of uh, sponges to use on their skin. But uh, kind of what's the, the link between sponge diving and archaeological discovery? Well, uh, one of the great areas of the world for collection of sponges was the Aegean sea and actually uh, kind of leading through down to the southern coast of Turkey into the wider Mediterranean. And so um, the Turkish kind of uh, had a, a sponge fleet um, kind of of divers going um, kind of way back in, into the past. And there used to be different ways of doing this. You know, you could have the naked sponge diver where this a, a person would actually just, uh, you know, a sponge would be sort of spotted on the sea floor and then a, a, a weight would be sent down on a rope to sort of guide to where they'd seen it on the seafloor. Then some, uh, a guy would uh, hold his breath as he dived down, also weighted with a stone to whatever depth he needed to go to. And these guys were able to go down to, in some cases, 40 plus metres under the water, holding the breath, work with a knife to cut loose the sponge and then have to swim and ascend. Uh, before their breath ran out, but also, of course, from those kind of depths, not ascend too fast as to risk the bends um, and, and as a result, kind of death, paral paralysis or, or, or death. So uh, naked sponge diving uh, kind of was was uh, kind of the oldest form of sponge diving there was. Then there was uh, what's called uh, dragging, where ships would literally drag kind of metal rods along the bottom of the sea floor to sort of cut free sponges into nets, um, which obviously is, it's about as destructive as it sounds. Then obviously with the invention of the aqualung uh, in the 1940s, uh, people could spend more time on the sea floor, uh, kind of looking for sponges and cutting them free without the necessity of holding their breath. So sponge diving had evolved over time, but what in the 1960s onwards, there was suddenly a, a decision or, or re a realization rather that archaeology shouldn't really only happen on land. Um, what about all the stuff that's at the bottom of the sea? And stuff had been found at the bottom of the sea before that point in the 60s, obviously, but it was chance finds, often by sponge divers who uh, would go, oh, we saw a bunch of ancient statues uh, where we cut loose this sponge, you know. Um, uh, but there was no real kind of sense of a, of, of a natural discipline of underwater archaeology that could go and excavate these things. And in the 60s, this started to happen. And uh, uh, an American called George Bass was invited. He was an archaeology PhD student at the time. He was invited to go and learn to scuba dive to be able to participate in the exploration of a wreck that had been discovered about 20 metres or so under the water off the southern Turkish coast at a place called um, Geledonia, Cape Geledonia. Um, and over the next sort of you know five, five years, they conducted the first kind of major underwater excavation of a wreck in which it was actually trained archaeologists under the water doing the excavation. Anything that had happened previously would be trained scuba divers going down, bringing the stuff up, dumping it on the beach, and then archaeologists then excavating it, which obviously doesn't really work because it does not allow the archaeologists to do their work um, of actually the discovery in context, which is all crucial. So this was the first time that archaeologists were actually down there uh, on the bottom of the, the seabed in their scuba tanks doing the excavation. And what George Bass uh, realised as a result of that was that kind of there's a huge potential here for a whole field of underwater archaeology. But they couldn't spend all of their time just swimming around on the sea floor looking for wrecks. They needed to very quickly expand their knowledge base as to where to look. It's very expensive. You can't be looking everywhere. And they realised that the sponge diving fleet were actually a brilliant resource of knowledge. Here was a whole bunch of people who spent their livelihoods on the bottom of the sea floor looking for sponges. And actually, if they trained them up, to look for telltale signs of um, ancient um, shipwrecks or statues, or in this uh, particular case, sort of surviving metal um, oxide ingots, as they're known, copper oxide ingots, which are how slabs of copper were carried around in the Bronze Age in the Mediterranean, then those sponge divers could be the eyes of the underwater archaeologists. And so in 1982, a Turkish sponge diver called Mehmet uh, Chakir was diving off the southern coast of Turkey, near uh, off, the, off the coast of a, a town called Kash. Um, and he, at 40 metres down, while cutting loose a sponge, spotted some oxhide, copper oxhide ingots, or as he referred to them, uh, metal biscuits with ears. 
Um, and he reported this fine up the chain. George Bass and his team came in, and in 1984, they located uh, the wreck that Mehmed had seen, which was known as the Ulubarun shipwreck. And this remains, to this day, now the, the deepest um, underwater archaeological excavation of a shipwreck that has been conducted by people just using normal diving equipment, i.e. not in you know submersible craft that can go to kind of ever deeper depths. They were working in somewhere between 40 and 55 metres under the ground. And for a period of 10 years, uh, sort of under the sea, I should say, for a period of 10 years from 1984 to 1994, they conducted 22,413 dives, spending a total of 6,600 hours on the seabed, carefully excavating and bringing up every single piece of this Bronze Age shipwreck that dated from 1300 BCE. And the Ulibaran wreck can still can be seen today. They've set it up in the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology. So you can go and see the wreck as it's been uh, brought up. But what this uh, wreck demonstrated was the incredibly affluent and vital trade that was going on uh, between all the different cultures and civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean in the late Bronze Age in 1300 BCE. Um, and there was... Uh, tons and tons and tons of cargo on this ship that when they discovered it, investigated it, etc., came from 10 to 12 different ancient civilizations around the eastern Mediterranean and kind of into to Asia Minor. So it just goes to show you, kind of the wreck demonstrated beyond all doubt that in this incredibly early period of our history, there was uh, a, a ginormous amount of trade and engagement going on between the different communities. And all of that came from a sponge diver who had been uh, kind of trained to recognise the telltale signs of an ancient wreck and then were able to bring in this new field of underwater archaeology, um, which from that point onwards, from the 1980s, has only gone from strength to strength. And now underwater, underwater archaeology is one of the most important kind of subdisciplines of archaeology, making fantastic discoveries all around the world. We had a really great podcast, God, I think it was a good few years back about underwater archaeology, but I'm interested in knowing, have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried underwater archaeology? So I do scuba dive, yes. And um, kind of, uh, it, it, it's amazing kind of actually some of the things that they talk about and the difficulties that you face that you wouldn't immediately recognise. Because um, w one of the things is that uh, as you go deeper, colour perception changes, right? Because colours don't make it all the way deeper underwater. And so you lose colour perception and everything turns into a bluey, greeny world. But equally, as you go down, the further you're, uh, further depth you're at, the um, air you're breathing, that mixogen and oxygen and nitrogen actually becomes narcotic. So kind of for every 50 feet you go down, it's the equivalent of drinking a gin martini. That's what kind of George Bass would say. So when they were when the archaeologists were excavating the Ulibar and shipwreck at sort of 40 to 50 metres, they were working under the influence of at least three and a half kind of gin martinis at all times in a world that was kind of very that was colour, colour reduced in terms of the colour spectrum they were seeing. And people have studied. Uh, the effect that this has on people if they spend prolonged periods of time in that kind of alien underwater environment, even as trained specialists. Um, and, and it's been shown to, 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 to demonstrably knock your confidence and your ability to actually engage with your job because you feel so unsettled and out of place. Um, and I think that's incredibly humbling, right, thing to remember that, you know, yes, the human humanity has created these amazing inventions that allow us to explore to the depths of the sea and, you know, to the heights of space, etc. But actually, it reminds us when you're down there in that kind of environment, quite how alien an environment it is for us and how much it still affects us um, from uh, from kind of our normal habitat habitat range, if you like, of uh, moving around on land. Michael, loved it. I love having you on this podcast, but you have so many other, obviously, ob um, discoveries that we haven't talked about. So that means that everybody has to go and buy your book so they can read about the rest of the discoveries that you have written about. Remind our listeners the name of your book. So it's X marks the spot, the story of archaeology in eight extraordinary discoveries. I hope that you really enjoy the discovery and what we try the discoveries that we talk about. And in the end of the book, I try to sort of come up with what's what's the kind of recipe for a great discovery, for one that really sort of punches through to become part of the kind of world public consciousness. So hopefully you'll discover the recipe 
uh, for a great discovery. And hopefully uh, you, the, the, the readers and listeners, will be inspired to go out and make some discoveries of their own. And perhaps even uh, we create the next generation of archaeologists who hopefully, I'm sure, will do a much better job than Indiana Jones ever did, um, because he seems to muck up to muck up every archaeological site he ever walks into. Um, but yes, there we go. But he does punch Nazis on the plus side. He does. Okay. All right. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will put your book out. It is out on the twenty fifth of May. So uh, we're recording obviously before the twenty fifth of May. So make sure you get the book when it comes out. Thank you so much for joining us, and um, love to have you back on anytime. Nice to see you again. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.